So the Trump administration is free to blame the media all at once, but the fact is the travel ban has problems. People have come out from around the country and around the world, frankly, to protest what the ban says about American values, but there are also legal protests. Attorneys general from four states are suing the Trump administration over the executive order restricting refugees and immigration. Is there anything to the legal side of this? Joining us with some answers is Laura Coates, <clears throat> excuse me, CNN legal analyst and former federal prosecutor. Um, Laura, I think it might be helpful for people to get the two statutes that will be in place. Some of this will be constructive constitutional arguments, but those are a little in the weeds uh, for seven o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> let's look at uh, the 1952 Immigration Act. Let's put that up for the people at home. And basically what this does is it gives a president really wide discretion to keep people out of the country if he thinks it's in the interest of the country. That was followed up by 1965's Immigration Act, where uh, there was a little bit of a prohibition put it where you can't get preference or priority or be discriminated against on the base of race, sex, nationality, place of birth or place of residence. The last part will probably be operative for those who are going to protest. What's your take? Well, you know, that particular INA statute is really important and critical in any legal argument that challenges the immigration ban. And the reason for that is because, well, when, it, when the courts consider whether or not this ban effectively um, is unlawful under that statute, they have to figure out whether or not the power of the president, the presidential prerogative to deny entry, is somehow was curtailed by congressional action to say we're talking about the issuance of visas. Now, the legal fallacy of all this, of course, Chris, is that one can't get a visa if they're denied entry and vice versa. And so that's going to be one of the big legal challenges here. But your overriding theme here is that presidential prerogative will probably undermine any argument against using that INA. What about the idea of in 1965, they changed the reckoning of what the president's discretion was and that you can't just keep people out because of where they are from. Obama's uh, law in 2011, his executive order, was to keep people out from those countries on the basis of travel to them mm -hmm. in select cases, not simply being from there. Will that matter in court? I think it will, because, of course, national, national origin discrimination is really the heart of that particular statute and what we were trying to curtail to try to prevent the Asiatic bar from the late 19th century. This was LBJ's choice to try to figure out how we could avoid having that sort of quota-based system and complete preferential treatment of people from certain regions of the, of the world. And that will be a good challenge to make in court. It won't be the only one, of course. The Probably the most um, persuasive one is the religious aspect of it. Which is? Well, the actual ban is banning all refugees for the 120-day period in Syrians indefinitely. But after 120 days, the Homeland Security Office has the discretion to try to allow people who are the minority religion in a particular um, state I mean, country to have preferential treatment to access to the country. And that, in and of its core, really offends the Establishment Clause, which says we are denominationally neutral and do not prefer, let alone endorse, a particular religion, whether it be the minority religion or otherwise. Is there a question as to whether or not that applies to this law, that this isn't about the official recognition of a faith, but it is uh, self-selecting to deal with people who are in uh, extreme circumstances? And, you know, that is the spin that is being, being cast, I think, by the White House, saying that, listen, you're talking about it being a Muslim ban, quote unquote, because of the rhetoric on the campaign trail. That's what President Trump, when he was running, that's it. what he said. That's what we now know from Rudy Giuliani. He was asking for, and then they found yeah. a legal way to do it. And, you know, that's going to be the key, because normally courts don't want to look at legislative history to figure out. But here, it's not legislative history. It's the rhetoric of a president and also apparently the way that they were trying to um, legalize an otherwise discriminatory law. And so that will be looked at by the courts. However, the bigger argument you have to think is, well, you know, his statements are uh, what he considers a territorial ban. And there is no indication on its face, besides from that 120-day clause, that it's just targeting a religion. And it will benefit both, you know, non-Muslims and Muslims in certain areas of the world. However, in this case, it's pretty clear that there is a preference for a particular religion when it comes to the minority religion, and that in and of itself is problematic. Mm. Uh, one of the things I think I was able to figure out looking at some case law over the last two days is duration is irrelevant. We keep hearing it's temporary, it's temporary. That's why they don't want to call it banned now, but that's all spin in politics. In the eyes of the law, what I found, tell me if you think uh, I'm going to be wrong on this, is that it doesn't matter if it's one day or forever. If it's on the basis of something that's illegal, it's illegal.
That is absolutely correct. And that's also the foundation of the Boston and the Virginia um, uh, judge's order saying, listen, even if it's a temporary inconvenience, it is still offensive to the Constitution, perhaps. And if there's any ambiguity as to its lawfulness, if you offend the rights of any person who has rights and access to the Constitution of the United States of America, mm -hmm. it can be temporary, it can be indefinite, it is unlawful. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, people who want to get into this for themselves, it's amazing how similar the language and politics is right now to what we saw about the Japanese during yes. and after World War II, about the Jews around Kristallnacht and what was going on in the 30s, about what happened with my ancestors and Italians and that wave of ethnics that came in. Anyway, Laura Coates, we'll see what happens in the courts. Thanks for setting up uh, the whole picture for us. Appreciate Thank it. you. Allison.